heard police knocked on doors in Clapham and said to men, you can only go out in pairs. You cannot go out alone at night because one of you is killing people and we don't know which one it is. People would have been outraged by that. People would have said, but that's an outrageous assault on men's civil liberties. You know, why should all men be constrained because of the action of a small minority of men? And yet we are absolutely saying that as a society about women. Hello everyone, welcome to this event which I know is going to be fantastic and what an absolute delight to be here with these two wonderful authors um, to talk about some of the most pressing issues of our time. And I'm going to introduce you both formally in just a moment. Um, but first, I just want to say how much of an honor it is for me to be here with both of you. Um, and I admire you both so much and the work that you do. And I'm very, very grateful um, for all of the work you put out into the world. So I am here today with Laura Bates and Winnie M. Lee. And as I said, you know, it's, it's such an honor to be here because both of these women are not only exquisite writers and storytellers and artists um, and craftspeople, but they are also turning their very exacting minds um, to kind of forensically examining some of the things that we really, really need to be observing, interpreting, and understanding in our world right now. And it's amazing to have writers who can do both of those things so well and who can offer something into the world that really helps us understand ourselves and others and the, and the political moment that we exist in while also giving us kind of beautiful writing and storytelling. So I thank you for that. And thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm very, very, very excited about this. And before I introduce you both formally, I just wanted to say Thank you so much to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. Thank you for bringing us all together here. What a delight it is to all be together again. Um, and thank you to Bailey Gifford, who sponsors this event and who also sponsors the children's program at the Edinburgh International Book Festival. So we're very, very grateful to them for allowing us all to be here. So. I'm going to now introduce you to who you'll be hearing from. I'm sure they need no introduction, but I am going to read this out anyway because they are both so impressive. Um, so, uh, to, to the far on my left, Winnie Emily is an author and activist who has worked in the creative industries over three continents. Taiwanese American and raised in New Jersey, Winnie studied folklore and mythology at Harvard, and later Irish literature as a George Mitchell scholar. Since then, she has written for travel guide books, produced independent feature films, programmed for film festivals, and developed eco-tourism projects. So impressive. After earning an MA with distinction in creative writing at Goldsmiths, she now writes across a range of media, including fiction, theater, journalism, and memoir. Her debut novel, Dark Chapter, is a fictional retelling of her real-life stranger rape in Belfast from both victim and perpetrator perspectives. It won the Guardian's Not the Booker Prize in 2017, was nominated for the Edgar Award for Best First Novel, and was shortlisted for the Authors Club Best First Novel Award. It has been translated into 10 languages, and Winnie is currently adapting it for the screen, which is very exciting. Her second novel, Complicit, which we'll be talking about today, is absolutely brilliant. Um, was sold in a six-figure preempt to Orient Fiction, and later in a heated five-way auction to Emily Bessler at Atria Books for in the US. The Guardian called Complicit bitterly convincing, um, which is such a good description, I think, of how, how well Winnie has captured um, this story. And the New York Times, which reviewed it this week, very exciting, um, said that it draws you to the edge of your seat and keeps you there, and called it cinematic, which is also brilliant given the content of the book. So we'll hear more about Complicit in a moment. Laura Bates is the founder of the award-winning Everyday Sexism Project, an ever-increasing collection of more than 100,000 testimonies of gender inequality, which has been described as one of the biggest social media successes, success stories on the internet. The project has expanded into 20 countries worldwide and become internationally renowned, featuring in media from the New York Times to the Times of India. 
Laura has an online following of a quarter of a million Twitter and Facebook followers. Laura writes regularly for The Guardian, Independent, and Time, among others. Laura's first book, Everyday Sexism, was published by Simon & Schuster in 2014, and in the US by St. Martin's Press in 2016, and in South Korea. It was shortlisted for the Waterstones Book of the Year Award and Political Book Awards Polemic of the Year, and named one of the bookseller's top 10 nonfiction books of the year. Her second book, Fix the System, Not the Women, which we'll be talking about today, was published in May this year. The Observer said it was an astute and persuasive page turner, a clear-sighted, compelling examination of injustice, which I also think is a really, really, really good way to capture the brilliance of this book. And Dr. Pragya Ayuwal called it a blistering manifesto for change. So I really, really love that these two books have been programmed together because I think they really complement each other so beautifully. Laura, your book um, shows us really forensically the sexist structures that knit together to form a system in which the odds are stacked against us um, and shows us how in this kind of devastating sleight of hand uh, we as individual women end up being blamed um, for the consequences of that system. Uh, and your book takes us through um, these really, really compelling arguments backed up by evidence and anecdotes through the Everyday Sexism Project about just how that plays out in all the different aspects of our lives. And it's so, so compelling. And then Winnie, your book is able to dramatize this through the art form of a novel and give us this incredibly real um, story of a, of a person who is living in this world in which all the odds are stacked against her and and she is she finds her she finds that she is being blamed for her own victimization and the violence perpetrated by men that she experiences and also as the novel's title suggests um, that she ends up blaming herself as well um, for her role in that system and you know, I think it's, it's so hard to capture that uh, in a novel, and I think this does it perfectly. Uh, so I'm really glad that we're talking about these two books together. I think it's a really great way to have this discussion. So we're going to kick off with um, a reading from Winnie, so you can um, get a sense of how brilliant this novel is. Thank you, Lucia. Um, so complicit, uh, as you can probably tell from the cover, there's a giant film reel on the cover, and it's, it's set in the film industry. Um, and I mean, I probably don't need to go too much into it, because you'll be able to pick it up right away. Um, but obviously, it looks at hashtag me too. Um, uh, there's a wine, Harvey Weinstein-like uh, producer that the main character, Sarah, had worked with 10 years ago. Um, and she's since kind of retreated into this quite quiet life as a film lecturer when she gets a um, email out of the blue from a New York Times journalist um, who's quite celebrated and he has a few questions for her about this, um, this producer named Hugo North. So most of the book takes place over the course of three interviews with this journalist um, where she is slowly unveiling her story but also wondering how much she's gonna tell um, to Tom Gallagher, the journalist, and how, and along the way is wondering how complicit she was in the kind of abuse that was happening. Um, so Tom, so I'm just gonna read a short section um, where Tom is in this interview, he's interviewing Sarah, and he has asked her about a, an encounter where she had seen Hugo having a drink, just a casual drink at a bar um, with a aspiring young actor, female actor, um, who was up for this, this important part, uh, the, the main role in this film. So Tom is saying, can you recall any other specific encounters between Hugo and female actors hoping to be cast? I strained my memory as of forcing it through a sieve. That was the first time I'd noticed. Undoubtedly, there would have been others. Well, what do you mean by that? Put yourself in their position. You're a young, aspiring actress. You audition for a role you desperately want, a plum role that could launch your career. Then you get a phone call from the production asking you to meet the producer. This could be when they tell you you've got the part or where you convince them of your talent and your passion. Any communication from a producer is a source of hope of what might happen. Did Hugo ever ask you to get in contact with these actors? I hesitate. I've been losing sleep these past few weeks trying to separate what I did from what I suspected, even that early on. These are fine gradations, painful reassessments for me. Most probably he did ask me to set up those meetings with these actresses and I complied. He was my boss, after all. It wasn't my role to question him, now was it? I just thought, okay, this is how Hugo operates. He has money, he likes to meet attractive young women who want to work in the industry. He's certainly not the first powerful, wealthy man to act like Matt. What do you mean by that statement? I stare at Tom Gallagher and wonder how much easier this interview would be if he were a woman. 
Well, it's not just actresses who have to deal with this. In my experience as a young woman in the film industry, it is fairly standard that at some point some guy you're working with will come on to you. Just um, Sarah worked behind the scenes um, as an aspiring producer. It can be subtle. A middle-aged unit photographer to whom you have zero attraction is suggesting a pretty girl like you ought to have a drink. It can be more overt. An older actor you've worked with for months suggesting you stay in his hotel room that night. And it can be shameless, a white-haired 60-something male film critic planting a wet kiss on your lips as you leave a party, his hand cradling your buttock. Such behavior was impossible to avoid. The rules seemed to be, if you're a young woman in this industry, you're fair game. How did you personally deal with that? I shrug. You construct a stoic facade to fend off the unwanted attention. I mean, I didn't, in any of those three instances, sleep with the male in question. I came up with some witty but firm response, hoping it was clear enough I was uninterested without having to be rude. Did it get tiring to deal with? Absolutely. Of course it's irritating. Of course the naive you is thinking that maybe this older male film critic is inviting you to events because he's interested in your thoughts on genre and female directors, when really, he just wants to sleep with you. Eventually, you stop being so naive. But the witty response, the ability to demonstrate a resourceful defense is key. Most importantly, you don't show weakness. Men are programmed to prey on weakness. Is that what you think? Well, not all men, of course. But in film, there's always a power imbalance. The powerful prey on the weak. The weak become disposable, expendable, then vanish. So if you want to survive, you don't show your weakness. Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading, and I'm so glad you chose to read that section because it gives anyone who hasn't read the book, um, and if you haven't, please do immediately go and read it. Um, it gives everyone a really good sense um, of that relationship between Sarah and Tom, this uh, New York Times reporter, um, and how so much, as you said earlier, so much of the drama of the story unfolds within those interviews. Um, and you kind of brilliantly uh, have that as the kind of as what's happening in the present, um, but you have Sarah also struggling to recall her past and decide how much she is going to say, um, and and how much she's going to reveal to Tom, and and also that Sarah and Tom's relationship is an important um, kind of is a is a very formative relationship in the book because you know there are power imbalances there as well as as is noted in that section. Um, so I'm really glad you read that. Thank you so much. Um, so Laura, I'd love for, to ask you to tell everyone a bit about Fix the System, Not the Women, and the kind of central thesis of the book, which I think is so, so powerful. So can you give us a bit of an idea of that? Yeah, thank you. Um, the book is really about recognizing systemic institutional inequality, particularly misogyny, but also other forms of inequality that intersect with it. And in order to recognize that broken systems are failing us, we have to shift our attention and blame away from women and girls. And so it's really a response to everything that happened in the wake of Sarah Everard's death when police told women in Clapham not to go out alone at night, after Sabina Nessa was murdered when they handed out attack alarms to 200 local women and the top Google search was what was Sabina Nessa wearing, when Bobby Ann McLeod was murdered and her local city council leader said that we had a responsibility not to put ourselves in compromising positions. Um, even the fact that after Sarah was murdered, um, the thing that trended around the world was she did all the right things and she was just walking home or that after the death of Ashling Murphy, the trending thing was she was just going for a run, which of course I understand, and I know that that was an outpouring of grief, I know it wasn't meant maliciously, but really what we're saying when we say those things is, these women didn't deserve it. They weren't asking for it, and that makes it a particular tragedy. Nobody knows the names of the women who were murdered the day before and the day after Sarah Everard, even though women were murdered on those dates. Few people had heard the names Bieber Henry and Nicole Smallman until in the wake of Sarah Everard's murder, they were then brought into the story. Our media obsesses over a very specific uh, white, privileged, young, pretty woman and her death, but we describe them as isolated incidents, and in doing so, we miss the fact that the opposite of an isolated incident is a pattern. 
So this book is about the pattern. It's about the fact that a woman is murdered every three days on average. It's about the fact that half a million of us are sexually assaulted every year and 85,000 raped. But it's specifically about looking at the broken and the perhaps deliberately unjust institutions around us that facilitate that continuing pattern of violence against women and moving away from this notion that if she had just done something differently, if she'd just been a slightly better victim, if she'd worn something different or she hadn't flirted or she'd been wearing something else or she hadn't been in the wrong place at the wrong time, that perhaps it never would have happened. And instead shifting that focus to the institutions and the systemic misogyny that are the real cause of the problem. And this idea of, of isolated incidents is something that really struck me when reading your book. Um, and, you know, as we've said, your, your book kind of elucidates how this pattern uh, operates in all different forms of life and all different areas of society. But the, the parts where you're speaking about male violence and, and these patterns, I found very, very, very affecting. Um, and this argument that you make so cleverly, uh, which I hadn't thought of in these terms before, and I found this really, really useful, is this exact idea of, of just how much people want us to believe these are isolated incidents. Um, and you know, you pull out newspaper headlines and things that use the phrase isolated incident um, for a thing that we know happens every three days um, and is incredibly systemic. Um, and so, in fact, that part of the pattern is calling these things isolated incidents when they are a pattern. You know, that's kind of part of the strategy. Um, and so I wanted to ask you about that and, uh, you know, how that contributes to the way, you know, as you say in the book, we end up kind of bearing the blame and also the consequences for this kind of violence individually rather than collectively when it is a societal issue. Um, and does that kind of myth of the isolated incident, does that, you know, play a role in that? Yes, certainly, because I think if they're isolated incidents, then they're unusual, uh, nobody could have seen them coming. Um, it, it isn't a kind of widespread issue, it's just something that that one silly woman did wrong, essentially. And I think part of the problem is that our society is so programmed around certain very deeply held misogynistic ideas that it's really difficult to get people to recognize just how absurd they are until often you kind of look at them in a different way. So for example, when police told women in Clapham not to go out on their own at night, a lot of people said, well, you know, it make, that makes sense, doesn't it? You know, it's just common sense. There's someone has murdered a woman. It's just about trying to keep women safe. It's not about blaming them. But had police knocked on doors in Clapham and said to men, you can only go out in pairs. You cannot go out alone at night because one of you is killing people and we don't know which one it is. People would have been outraged by that. People would have said, but that's an outrageous assault on men's civil liberties. You know, why should all men be constrained because of the action of a small minority of men? And yet we are absolutely saying that as a society about women that as a society, that as a group, women's lives, that women's freedoms should be curtailed and constrained, and that we are prepared to accept a certain baseline of female pain, of female disposability, of female um, assault as a kind of acceptable point from which things begin. It's okay for all women's lives to be constrained by that, but not all men's. And, and when you kind of flip things on their head, I think that's when you start to recognize that the point at which we're starting is not neutral. It's the same, for example, with um, the phrases that we see used to describe things like, um, for example, uh, unwanted sex, um, or we see people talking about, um, we don't see discussions of um, uh, theft being described as non-consensual borrowing. Um, <laughs> We don't find somebody who has had their house burned down, somebody who's been perhaps a victim of arson, sitting in court in the absurd position of realizing that the police have confiscated his mobile phone and gone through it, and suddenly in court he's expected to explain, well, you went to a bonfire party three years ago, so maybe you secretly enjoyed this. There is absurdity here, and because it's so extreme, we don't even necessarily recognize it. And I think that that's what the isolated instance narrative does. It enables us not to recognize a pattern. Absolutely, and it does kind of rely on that absurdity and, and, yeah. and not interrogating the pattern. And the thing about you know, them telling us um, when Sarah was murdered not to walk home at certain times of night or not to walk through certain parks, 
um, and just to stay home. You know, that's also absurd because we know that the majority of violence against women is visited upon us in the home. Exactly. And, and we are actually more likely to be um, assaulted by men that we know uh, and, and who live in our home than, than in parks. So, you know, even on that level, there's, there's nothing safe about staying home all the time, statistically. Yeah. So it's just a very frustrating um, thing. And I think that Winnie, your novel, deals with this really, really well as well. I was thinking about both books and this idea of isolated incidents because I think this is something that Sarah struggles with yeah. throughout the book um, because Sarah is, she's approached by this New York Times journalist and asked about her involvement with this financier, Hugo North, um, who is kind of, has been accused of various degrees of sexual misconduct. And one of the things I think that you do so well in her character development and you know as the story goes on is is she's perhaps kind of having a realization about a pattern yeah. um, and about you know how isolated or otherwise different things that she thinks she saw or or knows or suspects happened were actually uh, you know how how isolated those things were and um you know it kind of builds up to a revelation of, about an experience that she had. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you were thinking about in terms of her journey in thinking about this as a pattern and there being more and more accusations coming out? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, the key thing, and the reason I wrote the book was, um, well, obviously because of the hashtag Me Too movement and also the Weinstein allegations, which finally went public um, in 2017. But, you know, within the industry, and I used to work in the film industry, um, which is why I was able to kind of draw so much from my own experience um, in that world, um, was that when the Weinstein allegations finally went public, um, I think in October 2017, I was like, oh, okay, I mean, that's not a surprise, right? And anybody in the industry was like, okay, that's not a surprise that Harvey Weinstein has been doing this to young women. And it was almost kind of an open secret in the industry for years. So other people had said, you know, I don't really understand, you know, if if everybody knew that Weinstein was doing this to women, like, why was he able to get away with it for so long? And I'm like, well, you know, clearly you've never worked in the film industry before, and if you are somebody as powerful as what Weinstein was at the time, um, for a very long period of time, you know, you can sort of get away with whatever, because, you know, you're working in an ecosystem that enables these sorts of abusive, bullying personalities um, that wield all the power to do whatever they want, essentially, right? Because everyone's too scared to, to say no, effectively, right? So I want to kind of like take an individual woman, a young woman named Sarah, um, and just kind of follow her journey from really wanting to work in the industry, because she loves movies, and, and is quite naive about how the industry works, um, and then slowly following her over the course of a few years, to, and she gains a little bit more power. She goes from being an intern to, you know, an associate producer, um, and following how she works in, in an environment where you are expected to say yes to these sorts of things. So it starts on a kind of sliding scale of, okay, just observing your male boss treating young women, young attractive women a certain way, maybe a way that's a little bit sleazy, or allowing your boss to touch you on the shoulder or that sort of thing, or when he offers you a line of coke snorting it because you feel like that's the thing that you're supposed to do if your boss is offering that to you. Um, and so that slowly escalates into a situation where there is more overt abuse of power and more forms of different violence, not just physical violence, but sexual and, you know, obviously psychological as well, and how you just sort of tolerate that, because that's, that's expected. And I think that's quite similar to people in domestic violence situations. Um, it, it obviously links exactly to what Laura was talking about in your book, about that spectrum of, of violence that exists and how, you know, Wayne Cousins, who murdered uh, Sarah Everard, you make a very good point about how he, over the course of a number of years, had been exposing himself to young women. And, and I think he did that just a few hours mm -hmm. before... Yeah, yeah, the day before um, Sarah's death. So that kind of spectrum of, oh, it's just, it's just a small incident, it's just a guy kind of like taking liberties to actually know this is violence um, is, is something that very much exists. So it's almost like kind of two sorts of spectrums, a spectrum on which a perpetrator can, can perform these kinds of acts of bullying and then violence or sleaziness leading to violence, um, and the spectrum on which you put up with it as a woman because this is just the environment where you put up with men trying to sleep with you or p make a pass at you and then you put up with them bullying you and then you put up with like more over examples of sexual assault. So, so yeah, I think a lot of it is about the ecosystem that we work in and just how or live in and how accustomed we become to the sorts of things I just described in that packet of passage. As yeah, I know. and it, it put me in mind of, you know, the metaphor about the boiling frog 
and how mm -hmm. if, you, if you put a frog in tepid water and slowly um, boil the water, um, it will boil to death. But if you put a frog in boiling water, it will jump straight back out. Um, so, you know, this idea of the things that we are forced to live through um, and put up with um, as part of the kind of social contract of our everyday lives uh, then mean that, you know, the water is slowly boiling around us uh, in, this, in, in these cultures of sexism and misogyny um, that then lead to these, these really overt acts of abuse. And I wonder what it was like for you writing Sarah's journey in that way, because I do think, you know, it's very, it's very hard and very rare um, to see a novelist who can capture that, you know, a character's journey with that much complexity, because she really is struggling with herself a lot and trying to figure out uh, what she remembers, what she knew, um, what she didn't know, and also, you know, the circumstances that, that made her powerless in this situation. So what was that like, writing that kind of process for her? I mean, I, um, yeah, it was quite natural for me because I wrote the book, I started writing the book when I was, I think when I was 39, um, and Sarah's character at the start of the book is 39, right? Um, and so the book opens in autumn of 2017, and I started writing the book just a few months after that, right? Because I was obviously inspired by what had happened in autumn 2017 and with the Weinstein allegations. And so she's looking, Sarah is looking back on 10 years ago when she was in her late 20s, and, you know, for me, when I was 39, if, if I count back 10 years to when, when I was 29, that was when I was actually violently assaulted and raped, not in the industry, right? Um, and that's in my first book, Dark Chapter. Um, but, you know, for me, I can draw a very clear, there's a very clear boundary in my life in terms of, like, I had my life when I was working in film, I was in my 20s, it was exciting. Boom, the rape happens, and it was, I was a victim of a stranger rape. Um, and, then, uh, and then after that, it was just, you know, my whole life fundamentally changed Right, and that's, that's the impact of that kind of violence on anybody, right? Um, and so I, I lost my career in film, right? So I, because of the PTSD and, and the depression and the anxiety, um, so you know, I was kind of channeling my own sense of loss about no longer working in film. So in some ways it was easy for me to be like, oh, what would it be like to be like a 39-year-old woman bitter about losing her career because of sexual <laughs> violence? I'm like, oh, actually I know that. So in some ways I was channeling my sense of loss. I was also channeling the set, the sense of having missed the film industry, right? Like I did have a cool, exciting career. I was on the verge of producing my first feature film and then it all sort of went away, right? So, and I really missed the environment of, you know, just going to film, film premieres and screenings and like the, the fun of the film industry, the fun of movie making um, and the privilege of being able to have, you know, your job be that, right? And then to suddenly have that snatched away from you was quite tough. Um, so I was kind of looking back on like how much I enjoyed that in my 20s and yet also how I was working with sometimes terrible personalities and I was putting up with a lot of ridiculous behavior on set or behind the scenes or just ridiculous behavior from people that were professionals in the industry because that was just sort of accepted, right? Um, so it was the ambivalence of loving film and loving the buzz of movie making but then also just realizing 10 years on what a flawed industry it was. Um, and that kind of ambivalence is what I was trying to capture in Sarah's present day voice. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And you do capture that ambivalence so, so well, um, which is what I really, really loved about this novel. And, you know, the moments I found the most heartbreaking are, are when Sarah is speaking to her students about how much she loves film. Mm. Um, and you just get this really astute sense of that loss, you know, and, and how much she has lost. Um, and you know that kind of passion and that love uh, that she now doesn't get to have in her life in the same way yeah. um, because of this kind of violence, which you know comes back to what both of these books show us so clearly, I think, which is again that even though these are structural issues and this is a pattern, we end up feeling the loss and the consequences on an individual level, and we have to carry that ourselves, which is another layer of injustice. And when we're talking about this kind of culture, this, the boiling frog sense of a culture of misogyny, one of the other things that I found so affecting in your book, Laura, even though I kind of, you know, I was reading this when it came out at, in the news at the time, but reading it all in one place in your book was really something else. Um, all of the stuff about the culture at the Met, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've had so many revelations about this, and I think, you know, when you're reading the news or you're following it on Twitter, you'll see the text messages come up as they're presented in court. And, you know, on their own, they are really, really shocking. But when you read them in Laura's book all together, it's really overwhelming. Um, you know, and there is, and 
this is what you do so well, there is no arguing against the fact that this was clearly, is clearly a cultural problem. You know, yeah. um, this is not, as you say in the book, this is not a rotten apples problem. Yeah. This is not a couple of people sending messages about rape and joking about rape. This is, yeah. you know, throughout the whole culture of the institution. Um, and, you know, one of them that you include um, in your book, and a slight warning for this because it is, it's very alarming, uh, is a Met Police officer who wrote, um, getting a woman into bed is like spreading butter. You can do it with a credit card, but it's much easier and simpler to do it with a knife. And, you know, that is a text message that someone felt able to send a friend, uh, in, which is just so, so, so shocking. And the way you set it out kind of all together uh, is really brilliant. Um, and so, you know, is that something that you were thinking about with this book in terms of really showing this underlying kind of rotten culture of misogyny and sexism? And, you know, the Met is a really good example in the book, but there are so many others. Yes, I think part of the problem is that we are socialized into believing that certain structures around us are infallible and untouchable. And I think that policing is one of those. I think that politics is one of those. There is this sense, the justice system is another, and these are three of the areas I really look at in the book. There is this sense that there must be kind of processes in place. And I think a lot of people thought that, and that's why a lot of us buy the rotten apple kind of dismissal. So explicitly, that was the terminology used by the Met Police after a serving officer had raped and murdered Sarah Everard, that he was a bad apple. And it seems like everybody has forgotten the second half of that phrase, right? Which is, the saying literally goes, one bad apple spoils the whole barrel. Um, so ironically, the whole point is that it, it was never about one bad apple. And the statistics overwhelmingly show how brazen it is to use that term, bad apple, when you're discussing the Met. It wasn't just that Wayne Cousins' own colleagues literally nicknamed him the rapist. In the previous four years, 2,000 Met police officers had been accused of sexual misconduct. And when you look at those who are, you find that over half of Met police officers found guilty of sexual misconduct keep their jobs. Only one in 18 Met police officers accused of sexual assault ever faces formal action. The police officers who were supposed to be guarding the crime scene with the dead bodies of Viva Henry and Nicole Smallman took photographs of their dead bodies and shared them with misogynistic and racist jokes in a WhatsApp group with 41 other officers. So the idea that this is just a few bad apples, it's isolated, that Wayne Cousins was an aberration, nobody could have seen him coming, it's not just that we're frogs in tepid, slowly boiling water. It's that people in positions of power who are very much aware of the, the system failings are going, no, 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 the water's cool, the water's cool. And they're given a platform to do that by a media that in some cases is complicit in sustaining the problem. So the problem, I think, is that these systems all support and reinforce one another, and they all help to cover up the institutional failings, the racism, the sexism, so that we don't get to acknowledge it. So let's say that you recognize these problems in policing, for example. You go, we need to take action. It's an institutional problem. Who has the power to require that kind of institutional change in policing? Our politicians do. So you turn to politics to find help and support in this, and you suddenly realize that only six of our 23 cabinet ministers are women, a third of our MPs are women, a quarter of the members of the House of Lords. And you find that 56 of our serving MPs in Westminster are currently under investigation themselves for sexual misconduct. And that when that story broke, the business secretary was promptly dispatched to the news outlets to use the term bad apples to describe the problem. So you think this is not necessarily an institution that will fix it. So you turn to the place that you turn to force politicians to take action, which in a kind of healthy functioning democracy is the media. Enough media pressure can force political action. So you think the media is the institution that we can turn to here. 
And then you realize it's the media itself that is telling us in our biggest selling daily newspaper that Angela Rayner is crossing and uncrossing her legs to distract the prime minister in parliament. You realize that they are in some ways perpetuating and exacerbating the misogyny faced by women in politics. So it's recognizing, I think, the interconnectedness between the different institutions that's really key to tackling that sense of normalization. And, and it's not an accident. It's not an accident that we don't see it. It's deliberate. It's partly an overt, brazen cover-up when we're told explicitly there is no misogyny in the Met. But it's also something that happens naturally when the concentrated power and privilege in the hands of a very small minority of people is replicated across different institutions that all work to protect each other. Mm, absolutely. And I think there is this kind of sense in with this kind of the, the pattern and this broad cover-up of the pattern, um, which is that so often even when we're presented with evidence of the pattern, people really, really, really want to look away from that yeah. evidence because it makes people very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, to think that this could be a societal problem in which we are all complicit. You know, I mean, that's the bottom line, is that the bad apples theory lets everyone else off the hook. Um, and, and we all really want that kind of comfort, and we all reach for that um, and allow ourselves to believe that when these terrible things happen. This, as you say, this kind of no one could have seen it coming, when in fact lots of people did. That's why they gave Wayne Cousins the nickname that they did. You know, yeah. it was very much seen coming. Um, and I think you know, that unwillingness to look at it squarely um, kind of feeds into these myths. And so I think what, you know, what both of these books do really well is, is kind of allow us to look at those patterns um, and, and be able to really acknowledge what's actually happening here. Um, so this is a question for you, Laura. Do you think that is kind of part of the solution? You know, being able to set out in really clear terms you know, the fact that we, we really can't deny anymore that this is a structural problem. Yes, in part, but I think how we do that is really significant. And mm. I think it, it, it can't just be down to individuals and down to women to be fixing the problem. I think in order to recognize and acknowledge structural misogyny, we need a statutory inquiry, for example, into misogyny and policing. Mm -hmm. We need inquiries that recognize the intersectional nature of these different forms of abuse and inequality. It's not just a police force where misogyny is rampant, it's also a police force where black people are nine times more likely to be stopped and searched than white people. It's not just a broken political system that completely fails to fund domestic abuse frontline services. It's also a system in which, for example, one fifth of women in the UK are disabled, but fewer than 10% of refuge spaces are accessible. Mm. If we don't recognize those intersections, then that makes it really difficult as well. But I think it's also about the ambition. When we're talking about solutions, we need to be so ambitious in acknowledging the need for root and branch reform. And I think being creative and brave in our idea of what change might look like, particularly within the justice system, where we have this sense that it is an infallible system. And the reality is that it was built and created really by and for a very small group of very rich and powerful white men. It really is a system that is unfit for purpose. It's a system where, for example, we're drawing jury pools from a general population in which we know that a quarter of people think a woman was to blame for being raped if she'd been drinking, and a third think that she was to blame if she'd flirted. It's a justice system in which a man recently tracked down his ex-wife, jealous that she had a new partner, waited for her outside her gym and threw her against a car, injuring her so badly that she was taken to hospital with fractures and broken bones. But in court, was ordered to pay damages to the owner of the car that he had smashed her into in the order of about 890 pounds, and was ordered to pay his ex-wife 150 pounds. It's that scope of the failure of the system, the fact that just 1.4 percent of rape cases reported to the police result in a charge or summons, I mean that it isn't in any way hysterical or extreme to say that we live in a country where rape has been decriminalized. And I think that is the scope of the problem. The scope of the problem in education is such that one rape per day of the school term on average is reported from UK schools, I inside UK that schools. Statistic. I it had to read that enormous. sentence a number of times, that is. And yet the scale of our willingness to engage with the problem is very different. So mm. when the story broke about the young women so courageously sharing their experiences of sexual violence in schools, 
when we knew that a third of teenagers say that they are sexually assaulted at school, teenage girls specifically. It was very close in time to when the Super League story broke, and I think that it was very educational to compare the two, because the week of the Super League story, it was on the front page of every newspaper for days on end. It was described as an existential threat to the fabric of our national society and our, our national identity. You had members of the royal family on mm. the front pages wading in to condemn it. And Boris Johnson essentially cleared the decks. You know, the government said, we will do whatever it takes to tackle this. We'll meet with fan groups, representatives, we've got lawyers, we're working on it round the clock. Mm. And they dismantled what must have been a, a billion pounds mm. thing within the space of a week. Whereas when it comes to a third of our teenage girls being sexually abused in our schools, the response is a kind of, oh, this is really shocking, uh, let's have another inquiry. Yeah. And I think that really shows you that our ambition for the scope and the nature of change isn't anywhere near as high as it should be. Yeah, absolutely. And that idea about being more amb ambitious and braver mm -hmm. with the solutions that we come up with, I think, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, and Winnie, you know, the, it's really interesting in your novel because this idea of journalists being, you know, telling these stories as part of the Me Too movement is, is a key part of the plot of the novel, you know, and, and it is, that's the mechanism through which Sarah comes to understand her thoughts about what happened and, you know, comes to reflect on her own potential complicity. Um, but, you know, but it also is, as we kind of said at the beginning, it is more complicated than that in that, you know, that her relationship with the journalist is complicated and she doesn't, you know, there are times when she feels pressured and things like that. And so, you know, do you think that is a part of the solution, this idea of more stories being told in the media? And do you think that Sarah feels like that? Yeah, I mean, certainly. And, you know, and Laura's got an entire chapter in your book about this, about the media and how, you know, the media is an institution and, and the way it, it covers these stories um, of sexual violence and abuse is fundamentally has an impact on the way the public thinks about it, right? So, yeah, I mean, I, um, aside from writing novels, I also, you know, I'm doing my PhD very, very slowly um, in media and communications about rape survivors and how they engage with the media as a form of activism. I work with a nonprofit um, called On Road Media about trying to improve media coverage of these kinds of issues. Um, yeah, and it is very fraught, as, as Laura shows very well with some great anecdotes in your, in your own book, um, because you know, there is a fascination with the Sarah Everard case, the, the very young, pretty white girl, um, but there's so many other stories that don't get covered in the media. Um, the way that an individual journalist might choose to interact with the survivor can have a huge impact on that survivor's own sense of self-esteem. There is so much potential for a survivor's own trauma to then be used for content and exploited and for that survivor to, felt, to feel like she or he has been exploited or used in some ways. Um, and then who benefits from the story being told, right? Like the journal, it's great for the journalist's career, right? Um, but, and, and their career is gonna prosper possibly, but what does the survivor get out of it? I mean, I suppose in terms of the story of complicit, yeah, maybe Sarah does get, she does get an opportunity to think and reflect upon this, but you know, that doesn't always happen in many cases, right? Um, the survivor can feel used and can also just feel like, well, this really important story of mine is now out there in the world. I'm now forever gonna be known as a rape survivor, right? But how, how has that helped me really, you know? So, you know, and oftentimes, I mean, there's the issue of compensation. Like, you know, if, somebody, if you're gonna share your trauma, are you, is there, do we assign a monetary value to that, right? Um, I would argue that there should be something there, you know, in terms of, um, you know, rewarding you for sharing your truth to the world. So I think, um, yeah, there's so much um, improvement that can be done in terms of how the media reports these issues. I mean, how many times do you see a case um, or a story about domestic abuse or a story about sexual violence and the, and the image you see is some stock image of a woman in silhouette or a woman with her face covered like in the corner, right? Um, so then what do readers think them from that when they see that? They're like, oh, well, once you're raped, that's gonna be, that's gonna be your life for the rest of your life. You're gonna be in a corner crying. Um, I mean, that was part of the experience, right? But then, you know, eventually after a while you recover and you are able to, um, you know, live your life in a certain way after that. Um, so, but that image of, of victims always being either victimized and their lives being completely ruined or um, gold diggers who are just trying to share their truth so they can make money somehow, right? I, I still really want to figure out how actually 
a rape victim would make money <laughs> from sharing her story, right? So, yeah, like, there's so much intricacy in the way the media works, how they choose the stories, how they choose to report the stories, and that can have a big impact on individual survivors, it can have a big impact on members of the audience um, who then might sort of absorb victim-blaming headlines that you might see, um, such as certain publications <laughs> um, are often, um, are often uh, likely to, to put in their headlines. Um, and that might also impact the way a future victim thinks about what happens to her, right? So after my assault, um, I, there was a woman who, there was an entire half hour radio chat show in Northern Ireland about my rape, um, which I listened to two, year, two days after my rape. And obviously my name wasn't out um, at the time. Uh, but, you know, people were calling in saying like, oh, no, this is, uh, you know, Belfast is not a safe city if this can happen to a Chinese woman um, who's going for a walk on her own in the park. Uh, and, this and this woman calls in and she's like, oh, my heart goes out to that wee Chinese girl, me, um, because her, her life is now ruined, right? Um, and I, I know she said that from a place of empathy, but for me, I was like, oh, okay, she doesn't know me. And like, that, that's a pretty stark pronouncement for me to be hearing. And that's a message that gets sent out. And I, you know, I don't think she thought about the larger damage of that kind of message, but that's a message that then gets sent out to everybody listening. Like if you're raped, your life is ruined, or a person who in the future might be raped might think like, okay, now my life is ruined now that this thing has happened. So it is very important to stress the survivor's experience and put survivors front and center in terms of talking about these issues and to show that you know, we're not always victims for the rest of our lives, um, although the impacts can be permanent on our lives, but you know, there is a way that survivors have the ability to tell the story and have the ability and the knowledge to change the systems that Laura is talking about, right? I mean, if, if you actually listen to the feedback that survivors gave on how to improve workplaces, on how to improve you know, rape crisis center um, practices, then actually you could have quite a lot of improvement, but oftentimes we're just kind of pushed to the side and you know, our opinions aren't really respected in a lot of ways. Absolutely, and that idea of, you know, how many people are actually practicing a survivor-centered yeah. approach to this, you know, is very questionable, while, you know, a lot of people would like to think that they are. Um, and I think Sarah has this experience sometimes with Tom as well, because she, her experience gets quite flattened in those interviews with some of his questions. I, that was the sense that I got. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she faces a lot of racism in the film industry, and he's often not very responsive to kind of having that as part of their interview and part of their story. Um, and is kind of sometimes putting her in a situation where she feels that she has to make the story simpler than, than it was, I think. Yeah. And that's probably something that survivors have to deal with with the media all the time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to questions because uh, we are going to open up to all of you guys. Um, so while you are thinking about questions, and there's going to be a roving mic, I am going to use this um, to take some questions from the people who are joining us online. Um, anyone here who knows me will know like just how terrible I am at technology. <laughs> so this has been making me very nervous um, because I was worried that I wouldn't be able to work it. But it does seem to be working, um, which is a surprise to me. So I'm going to take one of these questions, and while we're doing that, you guys can think about what you would like to ask. So. We have a question um, from an online listener saying, and it's not addressed to either one of you, so either one can answer. Thank you for such clarity and truth. Why is it that men resist acknowledging that it is their gender that is that becomes so dangerous for women? Uh, you wrote a whole book about this. <laughs> <laughs> you can go first. Um. Um, I think there's a lot of different answers to it. Um, I think sometimes it is um, a kind of defensive, knee-jerk, panic mm -hmm. reaction. I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding about the language that we use when we're talking about this. So, for example, the term toxic masculinity, which I think people hear and they hear toxic men, when mm -hmm. what we're really talking about is a, a form of um, assumption and a, a set of stringent requirements of men within our society that are devastating to men as well as to women. It's actually a very compassionate mm -hmm. phrase towards men. Um, I think that it is also driven by a radicalization that is happening. There has been an immense backlash to the recent rise in feminist uh, talk in the public sphere, and part of that has manifested itself as a very powerful form of terrorism. Um, and I know that people might find that a shocking word to use, uh, 
but I am talking very specifically about circumstances that meet every international definition for terrorism, radicalization, extremism, grooming. Essentially, men of all ages, but particularly young men who are being groomed online into hatred of a specific demographic group, in this particular case, women, who are being extorted to take offline steps to punish women, to exact physical and sexual violence on them, and who in some cases do just that. And when those massacres occur, and they are explicitly and very clearly evidentially driven by that process of online radicalization, we do not call them terrorism. Mm. So I'm thinking, for example, of Elliot Rodger and the Santa Barbara massacre, of Alec Manassian and the Toronto ban attack, but also of many, many more of those sorts of examples and experiences. And I think that that is a very, very powerful force. I think that it is supported actively by social media algorithms. Anyone who's yep. seen the coverage of Andrew Tate in the last week and the fact that despite very clearly breaching social media guidelines of the platforms he's on um, for misogyny and hate speech, he's still got 11 billion views on TikTok, many of them from impressionable young men. So I think that men are being really indoctrinated into these ideas. And I think that the impact is much greater than we want to recognize. 27% of American men now say that they won't have a one-to-one -one meeting on their own with a woman in the workplace. So there is a sense of fear, and I think that denial and that pushback always comes from a place of fear. And the fear has now become so whipped up and is so disproportionate to the reality that many men genuinely fear that good men everywhere are losing their jobs and careers and livelihoods because of spurious and entirely unfounded allegations of sexual assault. Most people are absolutely shocked to learn that a man in the UK is 230 times more likely to be raped himself than to be falsely accused of rape. And that gives you a sense of just how far that online ideology has gone in infecting our society. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a question from the audience now. So I think, oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you mentioned very briefly um, people who have disabilities and learning disabilities. One of the things stuck things when I was growing up was I wasn't taught about boundaries and consent. So and when I was growing up, um, I had a trauma. And then obviously I became overly demonstrative, meaning just hugged everyone. And I didn't know the lines between a handshake I got it. and then it, it wasn't until I was taught I um, by my work about, by, you know, we did a seminar on boundaries and consent and how to approach someone. You shake their hand, you don't go for a, a hug. You know, that can be misconstrued. Um, but one of the things is um, just we weren't taught. Mm. Like, when I was growing up, it was like, you hug everyone, you, 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 you touch them, and, uh, you know, because oh, when I was growing up, I was looking at people going, hang on, that person's really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And then I had to go back and say, I'm so, so sorry. And I'm like, oh, no, it's okay, I just don't like being touched. And it's like, why didn't you tell me? Mm -hmm. Oh, because you hug everyone, so it's like, is that kind of, um, you were saying about the frog in the boiling water, is that kind of situation for myself where, you know, um, I'm just learning, if that makes sense, mm. how to approach different people. But because of what happened to me when I was younger, you know, I was just taught, you know, you have to treat everyone the same. Mm. And you can, I couldn't read social cues. Mm. So I couldn't tell when some, if someone's face was like, Oh, hang on, she's approaching me. And that was both men and women as well. So, yeah, that's my question is, do you think there should be more training for people with disabilities on how to kind of read social cues and how to, like, um, know what, what, is, uh, what an inappropriate, inappropriate situation is? Thank you so much for that wonderful question. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I mean, education in general, again, as Laura has, has written in, in so well in your book, is teaching 
consent um, and teaching proper boundaries um, is really important, but then also having that more specialized for certain communities like disability or certain communities, even immigrant communities where language skills aren't as good. Um, and I mean, there's so many different scenarios where the understanding of consent needs to be more fully articulated, more fully explained. Um, and I think that is, that is key for not just trying to encourage people not to be perpetrators, but also under, having people out there understand what is, what is the right way for their body to be respected. Mm -hmm. And did you want to say anything about that? You do have a... Um, I think just that it was a really good example, actually, thank you, of, of how I think from childhood these things, mm. if, if we don't, as you say, address things in childhood, then, then people don't necessarily know. And I think it's a great example of how actually we can be learning about sexual consent and about boundaries and all of those things without having to be, you know, talking to two-year-olds about sex. People are very uptight about this. You know, you just can't do it. We shouldn't talk to young people about it. But you're right. Of course we could from an earlier age. You know, for example, within our own families, that expectation, for example, that a little girl must give grandpa a kiss or a hug or must allow an uncle to hug her whether she wants to or not, teaches her certain things about her body and men's rights to it, which actually for young people of all genders, we can be teaching them, you know, how do you want to say goodbye today? Do you want to give grandpa a high five or a wave or blow a kiss or do you want to give a hug? And actually there are really p positive ways I think that we could be doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for one more quick question. Does anyone have? So, yeah. Thank you. Um, this talk is um, misogyny laid bare and um, misogyny is the hatred of women. And um, I guess one question that we haven't looked at is why do you believe men have a hatred of women? It's really conscious of the fact that there is one minute and 20 seconds yeah. left. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the answer to this could be an hour. Um, I think it comes down to um, fear and normalization and a sense of aggrievement about perceived entitlement being taken away. Um, I think it's partly about the framing of progress, which is so often framed as a threat to men and taking something away from men mm. rather than progressing all of us together. I think that we make a fatal flaw in suggesting that women's rights are for women and a women's issue when the reality is that tackling the negative gender stereotypes that devastate all of our lives would have a massive positive impact for men alongside the fact that women are disproportionately impacted by them. The flip side, for example, of the fact that uh, women are considered hormonal and hysterical and you have major scientists saying you can't put them in a lab because they'll have sex with you or fall in love with you is the fact that we're teaching men that boys don't cry and that men are tough and manly and don't share their emotions. And by the time that you reach university, fewer than a third of the students accessing counseling services are boys. And then you reach a point where the male suicide rate is three times higher than it is for women and one of the leading causes of death for men. So I think recognizing that this is about all of us together and it's about something that will benefit all of us and about something that damages all of us is really the key to, to tackling that sense of hate, which I think comes from a completely unfounded sense of fear, something being taken away, and of this being something that is against them, when the reality is that it's something that is, is for them and, and would embrace them. I think that's a great note to end on. So I would um, invite you to applaud our two brilliant authors. <laughs>